The title of chapter 13 is The Rise of Mass Democracy. So uh, Movement West is causing a lot of this. So Politics by the People is the, the first title that we're going to talk about here. So I like to refer to this as the my, because you're not going to hear this anywhere else, but I came up with this, is a, my window in time theory. There is a small window in time that eventually closed uh, uh, where the common man had a lot of power and a lot of say in what went on in politics and who got elected. So it says here by 1820, aristocracy, the elite, the rich, was becoming a farce, meaning it was, it was no longer um, the way to go. And democracy was becoming respectable. And the reason is, is because people moved west and those people who are moving west are not the rich people. Candidates often came from humble beginnings. Um, as we said, they're the people who are moving west. They're a common man. Politicians, whether they were rich or whether they weren't rich, had to bend to appease and appeal to the masses, to the common man. This is where you get the rise of war heroes. Um, people like Andrew Jackson and William Henry Harrison. People like Davy Crockett, who was more well known for hunting bears than he was for politics. These guys are going to get elected to office. And the reason is, is because of the window in time. Now follow, follow along with me when I talk about this. As people moved west, so went the political power. You know that there were originally 13 states. Well, 13 is turning into, by this time, 22, 23, 24 states. The people who are moving into those western states are common men because rich people are not putting all their belongings in a backpack and moving out west. They're staying in Virginia. They're staying in New York and Massachusetts where they could spend their money. So the elite, the rich are in the west. But as more states come into the union, those states are going to be filled with common men who are adventuresome and looking to make something of themselves, not rich people. So as the western states overtook the eastern states numbers wise it goes to show that they're going to get people elected right they're going to have more power than the east coast states because of num sheer numbers the senators and house of representative members from tennessee from kentucky from missouri they're not going to be rich people because there are no rich people in those states in the beginning Okay, so I call it a window in time because that will change. That will change. Pe rich people will develop in those states and they will once again take over the political positions. So, but, but for this window in time, the common man had more power than they ever had before. They oftentimes call this period the Jacksonian democracy, or J Jacksonian democratic period. And we'll be talking about that. So here, here's An Andrew Jackson. Now, let me tell you this. The, the reason they call it is, is this is not because of this one man, Andrew Jackson. I mean, heck, you could say that the reason Andrew Jackson got elected president in 1828 was because of this westward movement, because of this window in time. So Jack, it's, it's a bit of a misnomer when you put Jackson's name on it, but that's the period that historians have dubbed um, Jacksonian period because he represents those values. He was a common man. He came from nothing and, and made something of himself. So some aspects of Jacksonian democracy, whatever governing that had to be done should be done directly by the people, not by the rich, by the people. Well, of course, that's what these, the common man is saying. Property qualifications for voting were all but eliminated during this time. They called it universal white manhood suffrage. There's a lot of limitations in that statement right there. But more people were getting the right to vote. You didn't have to necessarily own property. So it used to be, here's what it used to be. You had to be white, you had to be male, and you had to be a property owner. Now, with the Jacksonian democracy, they're eliminating the property qualification. 
So you still had to be white and you still had to be a male to be able to vote. Universal white manhood suffrage, they called it. More people getting the right to vote. Nominating conventions were replacing the old caucus. A caucus is a secret meeting that they would choose who the candidates that were going to run for president were going to be. A nominating convention is where the people have more say. We saw just go through it, it being an election year. We saw this whole process. Uh, we'll talk about more about that in class. Voter turnout increased. Um, we just, uh, here, here we are in, in uh, November, um, November 5th, two days after the election, and we're finding out that this was the largest um, amount of people that have voted since 1900. So voter turnout used to be a lot more than it is today. You just happen to be living through a time where voter turnout, especially in this last election, was really, really high. Okay, so here, here's, the, here's an example of universal white manhood suffrage. You look at, at this um, map right over here on the left, and you've got a lot of green territory. And this is the year 1800, before Jacksonian democracy, more during the Jeffersonian period. You have a lot of green, which means there's restrictions there. Property qualifications. You had to own property. You had to be white. You had to be male. There were a few, um, Kentucky and Vermont, couple, uh, that had universal white manhood suffrage. That you didn't have to own property there. Um, a little bit more democratic than the green in between was the red. Georgia, Pennsylvania, and New Hampshire, which you didn't necessarily have to own property, but you had to pay taxes. So the least restrictive was green and then red. And then the, excuse me, I said that wrong. The most restrictive, the limited number of people that would vote would be the green. You had to own property. And then red, you didn't have to own property, but you still had to pay taxes to the yellow, which you didn't have to pay taxes and you didn't have to own property. You just had to be white and you just had to be male. So definitely some quality. Uh, some uh, roadblocks to voting for sure, no matter how you look at it. 30 years later, you're seeing a lot less green, a lot more red and yellow, meaning during those, those 30 years, the Jacksonian period, we're, we're entering into window in time theory, more people getting the right to vote, and that's significant in history. Okay, so let's talk about one of the most controversial elections in American history. Again, I reiterate, we're living through one of the most controversial elections in American history. Um, but here's one in 1824. Now, you know, what you know about 1824 is it's during the era of good feelings. And during the era of good feelings, there was only one political party. Consequently, all four people who went for the presidency were all from the same political party. They were called the Democrat Republicans, even though they, they believed different, differently. So, um, that, this is a consequence of a one-party system right here, the election of 1824, and a big reason why they went back to a two-party system after this election. But you had, at this time, you had uh, the Democrat Republicans nominate a war hero, Andrew Jackson, uh, very well known because of his exploits on the battlefield, uh, a man of the people. He was from Tennessee. And then after that, you had a more elitist uh, John Quincy Adams, who was the son of John Adams and the former Secretary of State under Monroe, and he was the, really the author of the Monroe Doctrine, but he came from bloodlines of presidency, right? So his dad was, was president. Democrat Republicans also nominated a Southerner by the name of William Crawford, who was from Georgia. Southerners wanted a piece of the pie, so they nominate Crawford. Unfortunately for him, he had a stroke just before the election and uh, was basically incapacitated and couldn't do any really um, campaigning. He did re later recover, but it took him a long time. And then we have our old friend Henry Clay, former Speaker of the House, leader of the, um, uh, the Warhawks, also a, a guy who came up with the idea of the American system. So he's becoming more and more well known. And you know how well respected he is because he is at this time the Speaker of the House. And the Speaker of the House is someone who's very well looked up to by his peers. So he had a good reputation. Um, so here, here's the deal. Anytime you have more than, than two people running for the presidency, is there's a chance that you could split all those votes, right? All the electoral votes. That's the key. And, and you know, because we just talked about it and we're living through it, is that it doesn't matter who wins the popular vote. It's who wins in the electoral college. Um, so, yeah, that's where things get really confusing.
uh, well, you, you know, with if you have four people, you could have a, a situation where they all split the vote. I mean, you can have uh, have everybody get twenty five percent of the of the electoral vote over, you know, so th this just increases the chances that that's going to happen. When you have two people going, like we currently do, trying to figure out who's gonna be president right now, there is the off chance that you could get it in, in today's world, 269 to 269, and it could be a tie, um, and no one gets a majority. That would be the only situation where two people are going that someone doesn't get a majority. Once you add a third person, you could separate the votes out 33.33% across the board and, or, or any mixture of numbers that any one candidate doesn't get over the 50% mark. Um, so yeah, here, here you have a fourth person entering and now you have a real possibility of that happening. and that's exactly what happened. So you look at the electoral vote count and you have the leader in the electoral college was Andrew Jackson, and he had 38% of the popular vote, which is well below the 50% uh, that he needed. You have 32% second with John Quincy Adams, and then third, you had Crawford, even though he was incapacitated, at uh, 16%, and then below that, fourth, was Henry Clay, the Speaker of the House, with only 14% of the electoral vote. When it comes to the popular vote, not that it really matters, but Andrew Jackson had 43% of the popular vote and John Quincy Adams had 31. So by all rights, it looks like the winner of this election is Andrew Jackson. However, that's not the way elections go. Someone has to win a majority in the electoral college. If they do not, then it gets thrown into the House of Representatives and the House decides who the president is going to be. So that's, that's where this thing is going to be decided in the House of Representatives. And the, they decided to take the top three. So the top three being Andrew Jackson, John Quincy Adams, and William Crawford. Interestingly enough, the man who was fourth was Henry Clay. And, of course, he is the Speaker of the House. We have a problem here. Kind of a conflict of interest. He was running. And Henry Clay is, because of being the Speaker of the House, he's the most influential man in the, the House of Representatives. He's going to have a big say in who becomes President of the United States. And one thing you got to know about Henry Clay is he disliked Andrew Jackson tremendously. Both these men are from the West, Clay from Kentucky, Jackson from Tennessee, and they had a political rivalry. Uh, so Henry Clay makes a backroom deal with John Quincy Adams and tells him, look, I'll make you president if you make me your secretary of state. They cut a deal. And John Quincy Adams says, I don't know if that's gonna go over. You've got, you know, I'm second in the electoral college and second in the popular vote. What's the public gonna think? And Henry Clay basically said, public be damned. It doesn't matter, I don't care. Uh, Henry Clay, another thing you got to know about Henry Clay is that he wanted to be president more than anybody in history. This guy desperately wanted to become president of the United States. He's going to try on three different occasions. He's never going to uh, achieve his goal. But Henry Clay desperately wanted it. So in the mind of Henry Clay, the Speaker of the House position was the stepping stone to the presidency. After all, people like Jefferson. Jefferson was the Secretary of State under Washington. Uh, Madison was the Secretary of State under Jefferson. Monroe was the Secretary of State under um, Monroe was the Secretary of State under Madison. So it doesn't it make sense, of course, if you're Henry Clay, that if he is the Secretary of State under John Quincy Adams, that when the next election comes around, he will be elected president because they, people are beginning to think that the stepping stone job to the presidency is Secretary of State. And that's why he cut the deal. So, yeah, this just talks about what I just said about it. And they, they called this, eventually called this a corrupt bargain. The votes were given to John Quincy Adams, and he became president of the United States under dubious consequences, under dubious situation for that, for this, you know, uh, circumstances is what... Um, 
the word I'm looking for. So yeah, a lot of people didn't like that, including obviously Adams. Adams made it his four year obsession to uh, get, get the presidency and, and make sure that everybody knows that this was a corrupt bargain. Important that you understand this too. There's nothing illegal about what was done. Deals could be made. And they went through the proper channels, the House of Representatives. And is it, is it the most upstanding way to gain the presidency for John Quincy Adams and for Clay to do that? Probably not. Was it illegal? Nope. You could do it. But again, you're going to pay a price at some point and the, you know, John Quincy Adams will become a one-term president. Let's talk a little bit about this guy who had really no, says here, none of the arts of a, of a, of a politician. He didn't get along very well with people. He had a bit of a sour disposition. Um, he wasn't very good at negotiations. Uh, he was a really, John Quincy Adams goes down in history as one of our best um, statesmen. Like he was the, he was in the Senate at one point and, and, but he really found his, his mark in the House of Representatives where he later would become, or um, later on would go back to the House of Representatives after being president, which is rare. But uh, yeah, he was probably more well known as Secretary of State and as a Speaker of the House than a President of the United States. He's going to be a one-term guy. His presidency is going to be dogged by the corrupt bargain, dogged by the tariff of abomination that is going to begin to tear this country apart. South is going to hate it. They're going to call it the tariff of abomination, and it's going to go really bad for President Adams. So let's talk right now about that tariff of abomination and look at how how deeply the South hated the tariff. They are the ones that come up with the term tariff of abominations, hated. Congress increased the tariff from a mere 23% to 37% and then later to 45%. Meaning if you bought foreign goods, you were gonna be paying nearly double the price or 50% more of the price uh, that you're gonna be paying, not double, but 50% more. Southerners hated it because they thought that the tariff didn't help them at all. There's no factories in the South and Southerners always needed tools. They needed plows to plow their fields and they would usually get foreign plows because it, it made financial sense. But now it's 40, they're paying 45% more for, for their plows. Not that they're buying foreign products, they're having to buy American products. After all, that's what a tariff is for. A tariff is to make foreign products more expensive than the domestic pro products that they make in the, the uh, infant industries. So Southerners just detested it. Things aren't going bad, or things are really going bad in the South. Um, as the other problem that uh, places like South Carolina is faced with is more Western states. So people are moving into Louisiana. They're moving into uh, Tennessee. And, and those kind of places. Their new states are coming into the union and they're planting cotton and it's growing really, really, really well. And in South Carolina, they've been growing tobacco first and cotton second and the land is worn out. They're not making as much cotton and they're, they're, having the, they're seeing that their cotton, the price for their cotton is going down at the market because there's so much cotton from the West that's coming into the markets. So they're, and then they're paying more for tools. So South Carolina is very, very upset about this situation. And they're going to make sure that they are heard. Okay, so we'll put that off for a second. But I want to talk about what uh, I just discussed previously, which was the reemergence of this two-party system in American history. Uh, one party didn't work. It was, it was leading to dissension. You saw the consequences of the election of 1824 and what a cluster that was. So you had the emergence of two parties now. The Democrat Republicans basically came, became Democrats, and they're still the Democrats to, that we see today. Uh, the National Republicans uh, were the old Federalists, and they broke off and they formed what's called the National Republican Party, and they are the forerunners of the Republican Party today. They'll go through some changes in history, but that's, uh, that's what gonna, they're going to eventually become. So in the next election, the national Republicans that were led by the president of the United States, of course, John Quincy Adams, and the Democrats, Jackson was their standard bearer. He was their guy, man. I mean, he was the one that they wanted to win in the next election. So let's talk about the election of 1828. I told you it was a miserable four years for JQA. So we, I call him often John Quincy Adams. 
And Andrew Jackson then used that time to, uh, you know, point out anywhere he possibly could uh, why that was a bad thing. So Jackson is going to pull this victory out in 1828. He's going to win in the Electoral College uh, uh, 68% to 32%. So it's a big landslide in the Electoral College and a pretty good margin in the popular vote as well. So yeah, now things are beginning to change as Jackson becomes president. It's a victory for the Westerners. It's a victory for Southerners. It's a victory for the common man, the election of 1828. And some people were even going so far as to call it the revolution of 1828 and comparing it to the revolution of 1800. If you remember, the revolution of 1800 was when Jefferson became president, when you had a Federalist, and then you had um, a, Dem a Democrat Republican become president. It's the common man's rise again, this time a real rise, though. Jefferson's, you know, uh, pleading for the common man. He, at the end of the day, not much was done, but st stuff's going to be done now. Okay, so a little bit more about this interesting guy, Andrew Jackson. Humble beginnings, no doubt about it. His father died um, when he was young. His mother, his, excuse me, his father, his father died before he was even born while he was in the womb. Mother died when he was young, a young kid. She had tuberculosis. Um, he was shuttled from family member to family member, aunts, uncles, whatever. He taught himself to be a lawyer. He passed the bar, the exam that he had to take by just reading as many books as he could. And he wasn't a great reader by any means. He wasn't a great writer by any means. He once said, one of my favorite Jackson quotes was, I have no respect for a man who could think of only one way to spell a word. And that's because he would oftentimes spell words incorrectly, maybe spell it two different ways in one letter to somebody. <laughs> he was uh, not a huge advocate of, of formal schooling, but uh, he, he was a tough guy. You know, he was an Indian fighter. He was a military hero, the Battle of, of uh, New Orleans he's most well known for. He was a well-known um, duelist. He, he would duel. He once had a duel with a man who criticized his wife, his wife, Rachel, and uh, challenged him to a duel and then made the strategic decision that he was going to let this guy shoot first because that was a rule in, in, a, in a duel is that each man has one shot and one shot only. So he said, I'm just going to hold off, wait for him to shoot. Hopefully he misses me, and then I'm going to turn around and shoot him. That was Jackson's philosophy. Well, the man was a really good – he was a sharpshooter and uh, he shot the president and, and well, he wasn't president at the time. This was before he became president. And uh, the bullet lodged in his, in Jackson's chest and uh, right near his heart. He got knocked down, got back up, hadn't used his bullet yet and shot the man and killed him. And uh, Andrew Jackson was able to live the rest of his life with that bullet lodged in his chest right next to his heart so he that's why they couldn't take it out uh eventually that bullet years and years down the road will kill andrew jackson and uh the reason is is because of the lead poisoning that the lead that would eventually bleed out of that uh bullet would kill him so interesting about about him he was very headstrong he used the veto uh, more than any other president before him. He used it 12 times compared to a combined 12 times by all the other presidents. So he was a man of conviction. He's on the $20 bill, at least for now. That will probably change. They, they passed something that said Har Harriet Tubman was going to replace Andrew Jackson on the $20 bill. Andrew Jackson, when it comes to money, the, the, the irony cannot be denied here. He was not a fan of paper money. And now, now we put him on the $20 bill. So you'll see what he does. He's going to almost single, he's going to single handedly throw us into a recession and that becomes a depression based on his fiscal policies. By fiscal policies, I mean, you know, how he handles his money. He was, a, he was, a, he hated the British. Uh, one British official, um, when in, during the Revolutionary War, he was a little kid. He was going to shine his shoes, and for some reason, the guy pulled out a sword and whacked him across the face, and he had a scar above his eye um, from that. Jackson used what's called the spoil system when he became president, and it comes from the old saying, to the victor go the spoils. 
meaning I won the election, I'll do whatever the heck I want. He would fire people in the executive branch, like, you know, like the postal service or uh, tax collecting service, which today would be the IRS. They didn't call it that back then. And he would fire people and put his friends in place um, in, in, in got high government jobs, well-paying. Hey, you helped me get elected. I'm going to give you a job. But in the process, he would fire a lot of people. Presidents will continue to use this practice of the spoil system for many years after until a president by the name of James Garfield gets killed over the spoil system because he didn't give somebody a job. But that will happen in the 1880s. So it's going to be around for quite some time, the spoil system. Um, the, the other thing that went on during his presidency is a little like kind of um, weird uh, thing that went on, kind of like a housewives of Washington, D.C. type situation that should, you know, it, it should probably never really made the history books, but it did because of the, the results of what happened in the Peggy Eaton affair. Andrew Jackson's uh, Secretary of War, a guy by the name of John Eaton, had a wife by the name of Peggy. Peggy's on the bottom here. Peggy's mother owned an inn um, and where it was very common back then for their an inn up top, bar on the bottom. And, you know, you'd have like prostitutes that would, you know, be up upstairs and men would gamble and then go upstairs. But anyway, that's uh, Peggy's mother owned an inn. Peggy, you know, there are rumors that, you know, Peggy, uh, kind of was uh, one of those women who would go up top that wasn't that proven to be untrue. But anyways, the, the cabinet wives led by the vice president of the United States wife, uh, vice president was John C. Calhoun and his wife shunned Peggy Eaton, the wife of John Eaton. They wouldn't even talk to her, all the different highfalutin affairs that they'd have around the White House and in the Capitol building. Nobody would talk to Pe Peggy Eaton. And Andrew Jackson really thought that was awful. Um, he, he had some issues with his own wife and people talking bad about his own wife. I'll talk more about that in class. But uh, anyways, he was so angry with his cabinet that he refused to even talk to them. His relationship with John C. Calhoun continued to get worse after this whole situation. He basically told Calhoun, you need to be able to control your wife. And uh, <laughs> Calhoun didn't like that, and uh, their their relationship went bad till eventually he resigns. Most of the cabinet member will cabinet members will eventually resign, and this whole thing erupted because of the Peggy Eaton affair. It's going to cause the breakup of Jackson's cabinet. Jackson then, after his when he was not talking to his cabinet, would talk to uh, you know this kind of guy he was. He'd have his poker playing friends. He was a partier. Jackson was. He'd drink a lot of whiskey, play poker. He'd have his friends come over, they'd play poker, and he'd talk about <clears throat> world affairs with his poker playing buddies who probably uh, shouldn't have heard some of the things that they did because it would be private um, and, and shouldn't have been talked about uh, by the President of the United States. But anyways, he did, and his current cabinet at the time that were very upset that they weren't being um, talked to and they weren't being consulted called this his kitchen cabinet his group of unofficial advisors, his drinking poker playing buddies that he, that Jackson would talk to more. So yeah, eventually they will resign. Jackson did veto a Maysville road bill. Just a little bit about Andrew Jackson. He's, he's a, a slave owner from Tennessee um, and was a believer in states rights. And there was a bill that was going, that was going to go through and it was a bill that would help his political rival, Henry Clay, who he hates and kept him from the presidency for those four years. Uh, there was a bill that would have provided money for the state of Kentucky to build better roads there. Well, Jackson vetoes this bill, showing that you know Jackson's a strong believer in uh, states' rights. He's a states' rights guy. He was a believer in that. Um, but there's going to be some incidents that challenge the, that philosophy down the road here. All right, so this is John C. Calhoun right here. And uh, John C. Calhoun is not only the Vice President of the United States, but also the leader of the um, kind of the leader of, of South Carolina. And South Carolina, you know their horrible situation. 
South Carolina is uh, have you know they they're they're losing money, not growing as much crop. The Western states are growing a lot of cotton, and and really South Carolina is getting destroyed financially. And the the other thing too is South Carolina hates the tariff, the tariff of abomination. South Carolina is desperately trying to make sure that slave, their slaves do not get taken away from them. And they're strong believers in states' rights also. So here you have it. This is some cracks in the foundation. John C. Calhoun, as president, vice president of the United States, came up with a document under a different pen name. He refused to put his name on it because he is the vice president of the United States. He created the South Carolina exposition that proposed what's called the doctrine of nullification, that states should be able to nullify acts of Congress. He, think, he believed that states should do that. Now, he was referring to, he, he basically said, I'm referring to the tariff. The tariff is no good for South Carolina. South Carolina shouldn't have to pay the tariff. South Carolina should be able to declare it null and void. If this sounds familiar, think back to the Virginia and Kentucky resolution, where Virginia and Kentucky declared the Alien Sedition Acts unconstitutional. And then that was basically corrected with Marbury versus Madison. Here again is you're starting to get Southern states that are saying, uh-uh, we, we want, we think that the, these, that the state of South Carolina and any other Southern state or any state for that matter could declare acts of Congress unconstitutional if it doesn't benefit their state. This would be uh, definitely a violation of Marbury versus Madison. And you kind of probably have a better idea about why John C. Calhoun, why G John C. Calhoun didn't put his name on it. The South Carolina exposition would definitely weaken the federal government if passed. So he didn't put his name on it. Um, and this was something that was distributed throughout the South and started to gain some traction, so much so that in the Senate, Robert uh, Hayne from South Carolina and Daniel Webster from Massachusetts participated in a debate over this in 1830. Robert Hayne, who was from, like I said, South Carolina, said the tariff of 1828 is destroying South Carolina. Um, and, and he understood that... Uh, you know, if the South just voted for this, it would never pass. You needed to entice the West to vote for it also. So they, he combined it with a bill that would um, not only, so part A, part a of the bill was the uh, eliminate the, that the, ter the, that the uh, states will be able to declare acts of Congress unconstitutional, doctrine nullification. Part B of it would be cheap Western land. So propose the doctrine nullification and cheap Western land. Well, Daniel Webster gets up and says, and there, you know, there's no way he pleaded for the union ending with liberty and union now and forever one and inseparable, basically saying, if you allow this to happen, the union will be destroyed because the states will have power. It will be just like under the Articles of Confederation. He urged Congress not to pass the doctrine of nullification. So um, it all was going to come down to this Jefferson Day dinner. How creative is this? Um, the South Carolina, basically, uh, there was a dinner put together by Southern states, and it was to honor the birthday of Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Jefferson had died in 1826, and they wanted to honor him. Uh, they invited the president to come. They wanted to find out what the president's position would be on the doctrine nullification. Well, that there's evidence that he would be for it. I mean, think about it. He vetoed the Maysville Road Bill, states' rights. He's from Tennessee, a slave state, states' rights. He, he's not a huge fan of the tariff. So there's a good chance that the president of the United States, who happens to be a very popular figure, if he supports it, there's a chance that the doctrine nullification could pass. And, and basically overturn the court case of Marbury versus Madison if it did. So they cleverly put this dinner together, honoring the legacy of Thomas Jefferson. 
And what you know about Thomas Jefferson is, one, he was a Southerner. He was from Virginia. He was a states' rights guy. He was a slave owner. And here's the kicker. He was the author of the, the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions, where they act, he actually used the doctrine nullification to get rid of the Alien and Sedition Act like 30 years before. So there's some evidence here that, that Jackson could be for it. So their plan was get the president liquored up, have him come out in a speech and support the doctrine nullification, and they think it could pass. Well, Jackson got up at the time for the toast, a little bit tipsy, raises his glass and says, our union, it must be preserved. Basically coming out against the doctrine nullification. Sitting right next to Jackson was his vice president, nice hair there, John C. Calhoun, who was visibly angry and his hand was shaking, he was so upset. He said, the union next to our liberty, most dear. So he's talking about liberty and freedom and uh, the South shouldn't have to pay it. He's the author of basically that South Carolina exposition that proposed the doctrine nullification, even though he's the vice president of the United States. Well, after this, he resigns and goes back in to South Carolina and riles them up in preparation for the, the uh, Civil War. Things go really bad against them.